further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Evelyn Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, the penultimate day of the semester. Um, and I guess this is the last um, of this lecture series for the semester. I'm going to try and <coughs> make it through this talk. I want to take you through a journey. Um, as the title suggests, it's through the Nana Bridge. And um, it is a journey where we'll follow the trail of a candidate qubit. I'm going to show my um, collaborators again in the next slide. Um, David Bracker just graduated, um, Alex Sung and Roderick, um, together with Tim Casirius, are actively working on this, what I'm going to talk to you about today, together with actually Pratiba Dev, who's part of CQM and at Howard University. And the title um, that I chose comes from, some of you may know, um, this, the follow-up to Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland um, is called Through the Looking Glass. And um, it talks about um, Alice going through the mirror into a fantastical world where she gets a view of a different kind of world, a different kind of logic. And one could argue the analogy doesn't um, hold exactly, but one could argue that she gets these insights into a fantastical world because of the different lens that she um, views the world by going through um, that mirror. So in a similar way, I want to tell you about a particular kind of lens, a nano bridge that serves as a lens to the atomic world. And so the players in our fantastical journey are the nano bridge, which is this, <coughs> which I'll be talking more about. <coughs> it's a nanoscale optical cavity that provides a unique and very high precision lens um, into an atomic environment. And a little bit of the dimensions will come to it again. This is one micron. So this nano bridge is about 200 nanometers um, in width. It's several microns long. And you see these holes that are punched into the nano bridge um, are on the order of um, uh, less than 100 nanometers apart from each other. So that's one player, the nano bridge. And perhaps the, um, the key player is uh, the silicon vacancy, which is embedded in that nano bridge. Um, it's a seeming imperfection in a single crystal semiconductor. Um, that seeming imperfection shouldn't fool us because, in fact, this imperfection or defect has extraordinary spin and photon properties. And together, the nano bridge and the silicon vacancy are going to help us um, explore a journey or start the journey um, to explore ways of um, sensing, combining, and transmitting information in a, <coughs> in a dramatically new way. And that is um, using, explicitly using quantum mechanics. So I think most of you, we live in a digital world, um, perhaps with too many digits surrounding us and barraging us all the time. And in the digital world, um, there are, we do have analog information, but a digital world information is a complex stream of zeros and ones. We call those bits. And those are the units of information. Those are the modalities of information. In the quantum mechanical world, we can have a wave function that we call zero, a wave function that we identify with a state called one. But the quantum mechanical world is very different in many ways. And just to skin the surface of it, first of all, we can form a state or a wave function that is a superposition of 0 and 1 with some coefficients alpha and beta. But more than that, we form um, a quantum state made of a more complex quantum mechanical state psi that's comprised of capital N number of individual states. Each of these particular states has some <coughs> amplitude gamma sub 0, 1. There are 2 to the n independent amplitudes. And this is what we often called an entangled state. 
this entangled state psi because we cannot easily um, disentangle or um, separate this state into the individual qubit states. Now, the big point here, um, there are many questions that arise. The big point here is by taking advantage of quantum mechanical information, there is a vast possibility of a higher density of complex information open to us. People have been working with the possibilities of this for quite a while now. There are exciting algorithms that suggest that for particular computational um, um, <coughs> challenges that if we were to solve those um, computations quantum mechanically, there would be enormous savings of efficiency and time. But I won't go into this um, at the moment. So this is um, a modality information that are not bits, but they have an analogy with bits, and we use the term cubic, qubit or quantum mechanical bit. So what makes a qubit? In general, it's a quantum two-level system. So there are any number of systems you might think of. There's the spin, and it could be spin up or down, the polarization of a spin. You could take a photon, and you can use the polarization of a photon. Um, and in terms of um, real manifestations of qubits and what researchers have been working on for quite a while, there are so-called cold atoms. Superconducting junctions are probably the most advanced implementation of quantum mechanical bits that are being pursued at the moment. There's semiconductor quantum dots, but um, I'm going to talk about something a, a little bit different in terms of a qubit. So that new modality of information, what, uh, what are qubits, and then what makes a qubit good? What makes a candidate um, system a good one? And by good, I've already put in um, the defining par parameters that I think are important. It needs to be robust, and there's something that I'll call scalable, which I'll explain a little bit more later. So robustness means that we need to keep that quantum mechanical state preserved at least during the interaction time for which we perform some kind of um, uh, logic, some kind of quantum mechanical manipulation. So if we have a spin, um, a spin up or down, we want that spin lifetime to be at least as long, maybe milliseconds, maybe even microseconds, um, so that that spin state will be a good state while we're carrying out um, the interaction. We actually also need a bit ability to control these qubits. We want to be able to initialize an ensemble of qubits in a way so we know what information state we're starting with. And not only the initialization, we would like to be able to read out um, the quantum information from this ensemble of qubits. And we'd like to, therefore, be able to measure the qubits with high quantum efficiency. OK, those are some, um, some wishes that we have for the qubit. And if that weren't enough, I would also like to, um, to raise my hand and ask for that these qubits operate at room temperature. Um, and I would like them to be in a semiconductor material environment. Now, room temperature, maybe for you it's obvious, but obviously a lot of the early experiments involved cold atoms, un um, involved, super, involved still superconducting junctions. That low temperature um, and that relative lack of thermal energy or decoherence gives us an advantage in terms of preserving the coherence of our qubits. And semiconductor material platform, well, <coughs> what I'd like to do is to be able to take a technology that we develop with these qubits that we're searching for, place them within a material system that in this technology is well understood because we deal with semiconductors quite a bit, work um, at uh, with materials in abundant quantity, perhaps large wafer sizes. And our idea of scalability very often in terms of 
um, electronic information has the notion of can we manufacture our information systems on a chip? Can we make highly dense, highly complex systems and manufacture them easily on a chip? And so that's the sense of scalability. What I'm going to talk about today um, with all these um, desired characteristics of qubits is a material called silicon carbide. <coughs> <coughs> silicon carbide, as you can see here, from this researcher who's working at Cree, um, a company that's actually been developing silicon carbide and other what are called large band gap semiconductors for quite a while. This is a material in which you can get six inch wafers. It's a material that's proven its worth already in more traditional information technologies for high power transistors, uh, for LEDs. Um, it's readily available as large diameter wafers. The crystalline quality is good. And because it has been already in, <coughs> in production, in device production, the ways that um, the approaches to taking that material and shaping that material into a device are generally, I would say, fairly well understood. Maybe not well understood enough for what we want, but at least we have a starting point. There's additional feature about these silicon carbide materials. Um, they exist in a large variety of different what we call polytypes. That is stable, single crystal structures in which there are different stacking sequences of the silicon carbon tetrahedron. Some of the most commonly used is called 3C for cubic, 4H, hexagonal, and I'm going to be dwelling on 4H, 6H. But it's amazing to think that there are more than 250 stable polytypes and that actually people can grow these. Um, with some degree of reliability. Um, and that you can control the sequence of the orientation of these silicon carbon tetrahedra um, with that degree of precision. Now, why I point this out is I'm going to be talking about a particular polytype of 4-H silicon carbide, and perhaps not in the sense that you might expect. But in beginning to work in 4-H silicon carbide, it's interesting to know and maybe comforting to know that what we may learn about this basic building block may be extended in terms of there's a rich variety of different structures, there's a rich variety of different um, atomic environments, there's a rich variety of perhaps photon, um, typical photon emissions from this one set of materials. And that gives us a very rich diversity of material properties um, to play around with. Um, I'm going to talk about a different, having understood that silicon carbide has been used for its optical properties and its electronic properties, the property we're going to take advantage of in pursuing on our um, route to pursuing a qubit candidate is actually a very different one. It is this kind of a structure. It is a structure in which somehow the silicon carbide, this is 4-H silicon carbide, is found wanting. It's in a way imperfect. Um, FRAB just by the way, since we're going through, um, we're doing the analogy of going through the looking glass, I'm going to use some of the um, vocabulary that Lewis Carroll used in his Through the Looking Glass. So, um, from his poem, Jabberwocky, and these portmanteau words, actually, um, I can't define them exactly, but they give the sense of, so frabjus is fantastic, joyful, uh, amazing. So that's the sense of uh, a frabjus, frabjus cubit candidate. So what we see here is, this is a structure, this is a C-axis, 4-H silicon carbide, and what we've done is ruin the perfection of 4-H silicon carbide. We've wrested two silicon atoms out of their rightful places, and what we have are silicon vacancies. Now, because of this particular structure, these two vacancies 
are in slightly inequivalent sites. That means those two vacancies, they're both vacancies, but they see a slightly different electronic environment, and you'll see how this um, translates to um, the performance of uh, these vacancies. So rather than dwelling on the imperfections, as we go <coughs> forward and explore the properties of these silicon vacancies, I think it's better, actually, here we see a beautiful single crystal that's been ruined because we've taken two silicon atoms away. Let's rather look at the complementary picture. Let's focus on those vacancies as entities in their own right, having electronic properties, having spin properties, and let's take that big, that larger matrix of a wide band gap 4-H silicon carbide um, single crystal as being the, um, the isolating box, the environmental area that protects these um, silicon vacancies from um, decoherence through interaction with the electronic um, states of the surrounding environment. So if we focus here on the silicon vacancies as the atomic scale units that have particular electronic, photonic, and spin properties, rather than looking at these defects, I think we have <coughs> the more appropriate interpretation of these um, defects. Just why are these defects interesting, and what makes um, a whole class of defects interesting. Part of it, and without going into too much detail, let me just show you what's believed to be the electronic structure of the negatively charged silicon vacancy in silicon carbide. It's known, and so some of this is known, some of it is surmised, and some of it has to be validated further. But these negatively charged silicon vacancies have a net spin three halves, which means that they have states um, or sort of um, projections of plus or minus three halves, plus or minus one half. So the ground state, um, the ground electronic state has the two spin states, plus or minus a half, plus or minus three halves, and also the excited state. We know from generalized selection rules that the selection rules favor transitions where the change in ms is plus or minus 1. And so that's why when we excite from a ground state level to an excited state level, it's I show 3 halves to 3 halves, 1 half to 1 half. What's interesting about this electronic structure is this, what is called intermediate state and is also called a shelving state. Shelving in the sense as you put it on the shelf. Shelving as you make a transition and the, the, um, <coughs> the strength <coughs> of these dotted lines indicates the strength of the transition from the excited spin states to the shelving state. So if we excite from the ground state plus or minus one half to the excited state, you see a very strong transition over to the shelving state. That shelving state um, then um, has a relatively strong transition over to the ground state plus or minus one half. Whereas what is different is if we do an excitation from the plus or minus three halves to excited plus or minus three halves, there is similarly an interaction with the shelving state, but the lifetime um, of the electron in the, from excited from to the plus minus three halves to the shelving state is slightly longer. What that means is that um, just because of the dynamics of the lifetime and the dynamics of the transition, there is inevitably a slight over time preference for the population of plus or minus one half states in the ground state. So we should expect that there may be a natural way of creating a polarization or net spin for these defects. Added to that is 
that for these spin states, if we were to apply a static magnetic field, B, that magnetic field will mix those spin states, plus or minus 3 halves, plus or minus 1 half, as roughly indicated by this diagram, which shows the energy, the different um, spin states as a function of this B0 in Gauss. What the two together mean, this sort of shelving and um, sort of driving to um, a, a given polarization ground state and the ability to apply magnetic field to mixed states in aggregate means um, that we can change by mixing states. We can change the relative population of the states that undergo this transition. And therefore, we change the relative population of the spin states. In aggregate, these are what this results in are two of the wish list items that we have for qubit. We have the ability to initialize the quantum system into a well-defined state. That is, we have the ability by pumping with light in a particular way and applying a magnetic field to define the net polarization um, of, uh, or the net spin state of this <coughs> <coughs> defect. And similarly, through the same interrogation by light or interaction with light, we're able to measure the qubits hopefully with a high quantum efficiency. This is not a given naturally, but it has, it has, it, the statement has the possibility in it just by this kind of interaction. In addition, we have, um, and these are actually old data. It may be recent data, and Alex may know better. If we look at the robustness of that spin polarization, there are a number of lifetimes that we use as a measure of how um, strongly that a spin polarization can be maintained. The T2 lifetime indicates the interactions of spins with each other. And so decoherence, that is losing that order, actually indicates a broadening of the transition that's a SOTI or the, the the, uh, the wave function that's associated with a particular spin state. The T1 time is the interaction of the spin with the lattice or its environment. And so decoherence has the um, net effect of reducing the signal intensity. These T2 and T1 times are in the order of hundreds of microseconds to milliseconds or greater. That is a long enough time, and there are ways of actually um, sort of revitalizing um, the spin states. But those um, lifetimes at room temperature give us great hope for going further with these silicon vacancies as possible qubit candidates. So two other items on our wish list, the robustness of the quantum state as indicated by the spin coherence lifetimes, and room temperature operation in a semiconductor material platform. This interaction of spin with photons is critically important, not only because we can use photons to, um, uh, to initialize a state, to prepare a state, and read it out, but because this photon the photon intensity and the photon wavelength or frequency being associated with some particular relative spin populations in the silicon vacancy gives us um, an indication of a coherence, a quantum coherence at a very local scale at the atomic level. And yet this photon can carry that signature can carry that information over relatively long distances. So the two together, that photon that is strongly coupled or strongly correlated with the spin state is a very powerful combination allowing us to understand the quantum mechanical state that's very local and being able to take that information over relatively long distances, long enough so, for example, if we had a number of these qubits, 
we could engineer some kind of interaction among them. So the message is the photons are, by, are the means by which we view and understand the silicon vacancy environment. So given the primacy of photons, and that's what I'm going to focus on, what does the photon signature look like? at room temperature, which was promised, which is promised as an important feature of these qubits. Well, this is the photon signature. This is the intensity of the spectrum as a function of wavelength. And first of all, at 300 Kelvin at room temperature, it's very disappointing. There's almost no signal that you can discern. All you see is this broad peak, which is what we call a broad phonon sideband. There's nothing distinctive. There's no clear signature of <coughs> um, a transition that's associated with the silicon vacancy. We can take the temperature down to 77K. We can take it down to liquid nitrogen temperature and make a measurement of the spectrum. And it looks a little bit better, but it's not wonderful. Um, what we see are these two peaks. So two peaks emerge. One is called V1, the other V2. Those correspond to the two um, distinctive vacancy sites in 4-H silicon carbide. But again, these peaks are, are, are relatively small. And again, they're riding on top of this broad phonon sideband. So indeed, if we were to, if we're so proud of this unique correlation between photon and spin state, and we're trying to get the information of our quantum mechanical qubit, we clearly need a better lens through which we can view um, the optical performance of these qubits. What is that better lens? Well, the better lens is something we call a cavity. A cavity is a uniquely engineered environment, and so this is what we're trying to indicate here. Here is our silicon vacancy. It's, in, uh, it's enclosed in the cavity. So the cavity is um, basically, one way to think of it is it's that optically isolated environment. It is that protective environment that allows, that protects the, our, our silicon vacancy from decoherence from the outside world, in particular, optical decoherence. <coughs> Hopefully, the electrical decoherence is um, uh, addressed appropriately by being enclosed within this large band gap semiconductor. But as indicated here, the optical cavity is not a passive, protective environment by itself. It is an environment that we have uniquely engineered to um, populate with discrete, finite photon states. So the, our geometry gives us particular photon states. And we try and engineer the photon states so that they're resonant with the electronic states of the um, emitter or the defect within the cavity. And in fact, that the cavity and the emitter interact with each other in an intimate way so that the electronic transitions of the emitter, um, that energy interacts with photon states in the cavity. The photon states in the cavity have a certain lifetime, go back and, and um, interact with the emitter. And it is a way, actually, if this coupling constant G is large enough, it is a way for us to do a number of things. It is a way to continue to control the, con the conditions of the emitter. It's a way of preserving and recycling the photons um, that are given out by the emitter and that are contained within the cavity. Um, and ultimately, because of this interaction, it's an exquisitely sensitive way. It's an exquisitely wonderful optical amplifier and a way of bringing signal from noise. And I'll show you that in just a minute. And just incidentally, um, basically for the cavity to exercise the maximum effect on the emitter, 
we want this coupling constant. That is, the rate at which the cavity emits, um, interacts with the emitter, to be much stronger than any other rate, like the rate of loss of photons from the cavity, or the rate of sort of spontaneous decay of the emitter without interacting with the cavity. So just roughly, perhaps you see that. That's, that's what that um, strong coupling of the cavity means. So just to show you, as promised, that the cavity can do this, <coughs> these are <coughs> the spectra I showed you before. After we make the cavity, and I'll give you a little bit more detail of how we design the cavity, cavity at room temperature, untuned. This is an untuned cavity. This is the emission signature of one of the transitions. The cavity has not been tuned. It's been designed to be close in resonance to one of the transitions, but it has not been precisely tuned. So you can see already the influence of the cavity. This is at room temperature. This is 77 Kelvin. That exquisite matching, that interaction and the preservation of the photons within the cavity, allowing it to interact in just the right way, brings the signal out of noise. So how do we, a little bit of word on designing the nanobridge lens. Um, basically, what you see here is, again, a view of the cavity. It is silicon carbide. It's a thin bridge of silicon carbide. And it's punctuated by a number of holes. And those holes have various, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically what we do with the holes is, for photons traveling through this nanobridge, the effect of the holes, I mean, think about the resonance in a wind instrument. The effect of the holes is to modulate the speed of the photons through the nanobridge. The photons see a varying landscape of changing index of refraction. That varying landscape of changing index of refraction set up, and I'll show you in a minute, standing wave stable solutions. Those standing wave stable solutions are the pure tones of this nanobridge. So we're looking for pure optical tones to match the optical emission of our um, silicon vacancies. But basically, this is a finely tuned instrument um, whose geometry determines the pure tones and the harmonics that um, are given by this nanobridge. To give you. <coughs> a visual view of what it looks like. This is a simulation of, where, of the standing wave patterns of the electromagnetic fields for a given frequency. So we, the, um, the dimensions, the size of the holes, the spacing of the holes, all influence the geometry of our instrument. And what you see here is this spatial picture actually corresponds to a frequency picture. So we pick a certain frequency where we want resonance. And for that frequency, we see that we have regions of very high electromagnetic field confined to very small volumes, because the distance between here and here is about 100 nanometers. Um, and what that means is we have an extremely high density electromagnetic field at exactly the resonant frequency of our emitter. Um, and it's designed to be um, an exquisite switch to turn on um, the oscillations back and forth of our emitter. And in particular, if we look at the high field regions, and if we were able to put our emitter right there at the maximum of the electromagnetic field, then the cavity exerts its greater influence. But as you will guess as we go through here, that's really hard to do. Um, just a few more words to give you some jargon that you, for some of you, you may have seen this. Um, for others, just to set the, the stage and you can then forget about it. Um, when we talk about how good our cavity is, a metric we use is something called the Purcell factor. The Purcell factor is something that was discussed as early as 1948. 
and is basically talking about engineering an environment in which the emission rate, the spontaneous emission rate of any emitter in free space might be enhanced when it's put in the right environment. Maybe enhanced by a factor of two, five, five hundred. So you can increase the number of photons of interest that are given out by that emitter. It has a relationship to this idea of a very dense electromagnetic field at exactly the right frequency. That is this V volume. Q is a measure of the low photon loss. So we need to keep the photons in our cavity. We want to keep that standing wave electromagnetic field as dense as possible to exert its effort. And then there's a component that talks about the actual interaction of the emitter, whether the silicon vacancy is here or it's out here, how does that emitter actually interact with the electric field? Is there a strong interaction? Is it the dipolar interaction? Or are they spatially separate so that the cavity doesn't exert very much of an effect? Um, so in terms of the design of the cavity and the implementation, what we're looking for, again, is this high Q over V, highly concentrated electromagnetic field of exactly the right frequency and the correct placement of the emitter or the defect in the cavity. Yeah. Yes, Q is one over, so Q is one over the loss. So Q is one over the photon loss. So it's called the quality factor. What is the spectral That's the, um, that's the dipole moment dipole. of the emitter. Let me very briefly talk about how we craft the lens. So the quality of the lens depends on the skill of the lens making. And the question is, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but here's the issue. We start out with something. This is a wafer of silicon carbide. I think it's about five or six inches. So we start out with it. It's a wafer. It's not, when I say bulk, it's not really bulky. But the question is, when you take a look at the silicon carbide wafer, particularly for Alex, who's taken too many looks at this, can you see the nanobridge within? And you know, the question or the challenge is very much like what Michelangelo saw when he, it was said that he could take a look at a piece of Carrera marble and understand how he could find the shape within. Um, so how do we find the shape within? Um, so these aren't Michelangelo's requirements, but it, they are ours. So for us to have um, a nanobridge of exquisite beauty and performance, we need good optical isolation so we're not losing photons. We need, actually, think about it. These are vacancies in a crystal. These are single vacancies. So think how fragile that material is. Anytime we hit it with electron beams, anytime we hit it with an ion beam, aren't we likely to rattle the crystal structure and remove, um, remove atoms? So in particular, in fabricating these structures, we have to be very respectful of the material and utilize processes that are least likely to introduce additional defects, the unwanted defects to the material. We have to, I showed you a little bit about the, um, the nanobridge and its dimensions. Um, they are not <coughs> super small dimensions, but you can imagine, <coughs> as with any finely tuned instrument, we have to get all the dimensions right. We have to have high fidelity in fabrication at the nanoscale. And then, after all that, we have to place the emitters in exactly the right um, position. This is in red because it's the hardest, but at the end of this, I want to show you that we have reason to believe that um, there may be ways to do this. So again, this is what our, 
Um, this is far more beautiful, but this is our nano bridge. Um, and just very roughly, what we do is begin with the bulk. We begin with homo epitaxial silicon carbide. We're very fortunate that we can get material, commercial material, where we ask for a PN junction, and they can grow it for us. And we incorporate um, chemical selective etch, um, and this is just a summary of the process. So this is something that we've worked on in, um, in uh, excruciating detail, Alex in particular, um, but I will go through it just very briefly. The idea is we start with a PN junction. We use electron beam lithography to pattern the main features. We achieve the optical isolation through a dopant selective wet etch to make this undercut possible and a wet etch so that we don't uh, we minimize the amount of ion assistance or electron assistance. And then finally, when the, fa when the nano bridge is completely fabricated, then we add the additional defects, the defects that we um, deliberately try to add by electron or ion irradiation. This is just to show you that this technique, this idea of having a semiconductor platform, being able to use many of the planar techniques that we use in fabricating other kinds of devices, allows us to make arrays of thousands of these devices. Um, and with um, very reasonable yield um, for these nano bridges, with very good um, values of Q. This is to show you that after we fabricate the devices, we implant defects at a variety of different conditions. And I'm going to show you results for um, implantation of carbon ions at 10 to the 12th um, per square centimeter, 10 to the 12th ions per square centimeter. And I want to mention at this point that we're, so we've made the devices, we've deliberately introduced defects, we haven't and we won't anneal these devices until later. And for those of you who work with um, traditional devices, not annealing the device and not trying to remove the residual damage and expecting to see anything decent is actually um, a bit of hubris. But you'll see what we're going to see. So again. Just by um, placing the defect within the cavity, we bring exquisite signal out of noise. But in an untuned cavity, if we take a closer look, so this is at low temperature, this is not even fortuitously tuned. So what we're seeing is broad background. We're seeing V1 and V2. These are the two silicon vacancies. But when we, we have enough spectral resolution to notice that V1 has some interesting additional features. And so this is part of our journey in looking through this unusual lens. If we look a little bit more closely, we notice that around V1, and I've already labeled it V1 prime V1, I can distinguish two transitions. So there are two transitions associated with this one particular silicon vacancy. That's interesting, but does it mean anything? Well, if we actually make measurements, we make the same measurements, and again, this is untuned. We do one measurement with the incident laser power, 600 microwatts. We do another measurement with a slightly lower um, incident laser power. Notice, and this is, not, this is not a fluke, this is reproducible. Under the conditions of the higher incident laser power, we definitely see that the relative height of V1 prime is higher than under the conditions of lower incident power. Now, why is that interesting? 
It's interesting because if we go and look in the literature, other researchers have reported that this V1 prime and V1 appear to be related to a transition where the ground state is the same, but the excited state is slightly different. That V1 prime has a slightly higher energy excited state than V1. If we take, get, take this with the fact that we see a higher peak for V1 prime when we have higher incident power in our measurement, here is the thinking we might go through. Higher incident power, higher local temperature. We don't know exactly what it is. Higher local temperature, higher thermal energy. Just the Boltzmann statistics suggest that we might have a higher proportion of the transitions making it to the higher energy excited state. So let's look a little bit further. Um, let's, this is fine, but again, the signal to noise is not great. Let's see what happens when we actually deliberately tune the cavity or our lens into resonance with these transitions. So this is a summary of what happens. What I'm showing you here is first, this is very much like what I just showed you. V1 prime, V1, this peak is actually that optical mode. This is the optical response of the cavity. And when I have any photons that overlap with the optical response of the cavity, I begin to decorate that mode because it's such a powerful magnifier. But now let me look as a function of wavelength. Let me tune the cavity. It's originally the mode is here. Let me bring this mode into frequency resonance first with V1 prime and then V1. How do I do that? The cavity response is a function of its geometry. If I change <coughs> its geometry <coughs> ever so subtly, such as by adsorbing monolayers of gas, then I change the frequency response of the cavity. And indeed, this is what these traces show as you um, go through different tuning steps from 0, 10, 15. You begin to redshift or shift the resonant mode of the cavity to um, longer and longer wavelengths until first the cavity mode comes into resonance with V1 prime and we see a dramatic increase in the intensity of that transition by a factor of 75. Then we continue to tune that cavity response until it becomes it comes into resonance with V2, V1 and we see an increased intensity of a factor of 22. So what this, the cavity when we tune it, this lens when we actually finally focus our lens, we see a lot more detail about these two transitions that are very much related. But there's one thing, even given the clarity of this, um, the lens and our tuning into resonance, that seems perplexing. What's perplexing? What sort of doesn't make sense? What's surprising? Or is it not surprising? Let me go back. This is one defect in one position in the cavity. It's the same cavity. The difference between these two transitions are two excited states. Same defect, same cavity, different excited states, different amplification by the cavity. Why should the amplification be different? The cavity has the same properties. The defect is presumably in the same position in the cavity. So it's in the same, it sees the same, 
local high electromagnetic field. Um, what is different? Why should I see a factor of 75 increase for one transition, that is to the higher energy excited state, and only 22 for the lower um, energy excited state? The probability of what? And so it could be that the matrix element, yeah. Um, we think that it may have something to do. So Q over V, that's the cavity. That's the same. So any enhancement, if we look at the Purcell factor and we look at the enhancement, Q over V should be the same for both of them. So if in our simple-minded way, if there's any difference, you're talking about probability. Maybe this is the matrix element. Maybe it's here. And maybe this difference means that there's a different orientation of the excited state relative to uh, the higher energy excited state relatively relative to the lower energy state. If we use that, so V1 prime gives us the higher enhancement. V1, which is excitation to a, an excited state that's lower in energy. Why is the enhancement so different? This is what the cavity should do to it. Maybe this factor is different. And maybe the orientation of that excited state, whatever the wave function looks like, may be slightly different. And if we do a very simple-minded calculation, which may not be warranted, that suggests that maybe V1, maybe V1 prime is al aligned along the C-axis, maybe V1 is slightly off axis. Now, this is a supposition, and there's lots more work that needs to be done. But the important thing is, imagine understanding what the spatial distribution of an excited state wave function looks like by looking through this lens. Um, I'm just about to finish up to a few other things that I want to see, just one other interesting view through the lens. And that is going back to this structure where I just see two peaks, so no V1, V2 particularly. And this, again, is the spectrum we see, very clean, um, good signal to noise, when we make our devices and we don't anneal. So we don't anneal. That means we've implanted. We've disordered the material a little bit, and yet it looks pretty good. The quality factors are pretty good. We get good signal to noise. So one would say, why bother to anneal? But um, we were interested. So we take the self-same device, and we anneal the self-same device for, at 750 degrees for half an hour. And we see a variety of different results. But for this device, this particular device, we see this. Tell me what you see that's interesting. What's different and what's interesting? And what's the most interesting, do you think? Sorry? The ratios are different. So the quality factors are better after the anneal, slightly. 2,300 compared to 2,100, 2,500 compared to 2,350. Under some circumstances, that would make people jump for joy. The quality factors are, different, are, are slightly better. That means the photon loss is slightly less. That means maybe we have removed some defects. But the fact is that the ratios are different. That means if the ratios are different, <coughs> That means there's probably, there are more photons emitted into that self-same mode. What we've done is just do an anneal, and I'll show you what it actually looks like in the next slide. It, <coughs> <coughs> our supposition is maybe the anneal <coughs> was able to get this higher intensity because we pushed some of those emitters into slightly better spatial location with respect to the electromagnetic field. Um, so our change in intensity, we think, is a change for the better in the overlap 
of silicon vacancies with the modes. Now, this is stochastic. Not every, um, not every cavity showed an improvement. Some cavities showed a decrease, and it would have to, because this is largely by chance. But here's another, this is a picture that actually overlays them. And there's a slight shift between no anneal and anneal, because actually, when we do the anneal, we slightly oxidize the cavity. These cavities are so sensitive that their resonant frequencies change. But you can see even more clearly here the change in intensity. And that um, is actually where I'm going to close, but this is where the exciting part is, and this is the part where um, Tim and Roderick have been ha helping us enormously. It seems here that this exquisite lens has helped us to see not only details of the atomic environment of this defect, but by using the lens while we do something active and dynamic to the material, it seems that what may be happening is that these defects, um, and this is the sort of high field region, um, may be given thermal energy, um, enough thermal energy to diffuse. Where do they diffuse? Actually, Roderick has been helping us with understanding that. Um, it could be random. In fact, there is a direction to it. Um, and what's interesting is, um, you know, this distance is 100 nanometers. It's not a very high distance. So actually, the distance between a defect and the nearest surface is probably half of 100 nanometers. So we can imagine during this annealing process, we are maybe annihilating defects that are interacting with the surface. We are thinning the intensity of defects. And maybe occasionally, we are nudging a defect into exactly the right position in the cavity. Um, there's a lot for us to understand here, and those simulations and experiments are underway. So this is um, sort of the journey um, with the nanobridge, the silicon vacancy. And this is, there are actually many such journeys going on, um, looking for candidate qubits. But um, we think that this is, we're at the start of this particular journey. We think it's a promising one. And it's one, actually, again, um, that we've gained some enormous insights from into this fantastical world because of the unique lens that we have by going through the nanobridge. Thanks. <laughs>